even though it's uh, not our new year, uh, but it says in the Torah, Hashem yispor b'chosol amim, Hashem counts with a counting of nations. So there is some, some significance, especially because people at this time of year, there's an atmosphere in, in, in America that everything has to change now, everything has to be different. As we were discussing uh, last Shabbat, people uh, Google this time of year, this time of year people are Googling the best way to uh, lose weight. The Google searches for losing weight at this time of year are the highest. People are trying new diets now. You don't, you don't look for diets you know, the whole year, but it's New Year, you're thinking about how to, how to lose weight. So it, it's a time when uh, the, the, it says in Hayom Yom, always you should use your nature, use your nature, things Hashem gave you naturally to serve Hashem. So if everyone's thinking about change, even though it's not Rosh Hashanah, but it's, uh, it is a time of uh, we're finishing Parashat Vayechi, Finishing, finish, finishing a whole book of Breshit. We're, we're going to say the Shabbat Chazak, 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 and Chazak to get strength. So, what strength are we talking about? Where are we going? Everybody has a hero. Children go up and they put on their, in their room, they put pictures and posters of their heroes. And they, some kids have on their, on their wall, you know, Michael Jordan, you know, he's the guy, Michael Jordan. Other kids have, you know, the, the favorite football player or and adults also grow old. Everyone has their hero. They think, you know, if I could be like this guy, Tony Robbins, yeah, he's the guy. He's going to teach me how to become the best in business. I'm going to follow his path. I'm going to be the best. Everyone has someone that they look at and they look up to and they say, I'm going to follow his path and I'm going to be, be the way that he was and I'll, and I'll be that way too. So who are, who are the, the heroes of the Jewish people? You would say Moshe Rabbeinu, right? You would say, Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. We don't have to look too far. We have lots of heroes in the Jewish people. But the funny thing is, in this week, ya- Yaakov blesses his, gr- his uh, grandchildren, and he does something very peculiar. He says, from now on, whenever a father will bless his child, you know who will say this to his child? I wish my child would be like Ephraim and Manasseh. Who ever heard of Ephraim and Manasseh? What do they even do? <laughs> Be like, I mean, if, if he said, be like Avraham, we know that Avraham is a man of kindness. Be like Yitzchak, be like Yaakov, we know what they did, we know who they're about. Be like Ephraim and Manasseh. Go ahead. No, I do this every Friday for my Oh, family. exactly, it's a and custom. They always ask me, the boys are asking me why Ephraim and Manasseh, and they're because they never fought. You know what? <laughs> that, that's, we're going to get there. That's one, no, that's correct. We, 100% correct. We're going to get there in a second. Very good, excellent. There is a sefer called Sefer Achaim. Sefer Achaim was written, a very interesting sefer, it's very, very relevant, the sefer. The sefer was written by the brother of the Maharal. Maharal had a brother named Betzalel, or Betzalel, and it was an epidemic going on, time Maharal, a horrible epidemic of typhus, and he wrote a book, a book of life, what people could do to add life to themselves. One of the things he told people to do was to bless their children on Friday evenings. The gates are open Friday evening. Time to bless your children. It's time to bless your children. It's not, it's not the custom of everyone. It's not, not a Chabad custom. We, we bless our children for Yom Kippur specifically, but that's what he writes in the Sefer. And what should the blessing be? The blessing should be, as Ali said, may you be like Ephraim and Manasseh. That's a blessing. Why Mishnah and Ephraim and Manasseh? Why are we skipping four generations of great, great tzaddikim and focusing on Ephraim and Manasseh? Why those guys? Especially because the blessing given to girls... It's much easier. May you be like Sarah, Rivka, Rachel, Valeya. Be like the four matriarchs. So why are you blessing our children to be like Ephraim and Manasseh? There is a bit of context we need before we address this question. El, you're on the right, definitely on the right, right direction, but let's get a little, a little context. Yosef is informed that his father is about to pass away. Yosef comes to his father and he knows, you know, this is a critical time. He brings his children in front of his father, Ephraim and Manasseh. And we know the story. Yaakov sticks out his right hand and places his right hand. And he crosses it over to put his right hand on Ephraim's head. Ephraim was on Yaakov's left. And he puts his left hand on his right, on Manasseh's head. So Yosef a very, does something It seems worse than Esau. It seems worse than Esau. When when Yitzchak wanted to bless Yaakov, and he blessed Yaakov, Esau didn't say, no, no, you can't do that, it's against the rules, but Yosef does that. Yosef says, no, Dad, don't do that. Switch your hands. He's the older son, he should get the blessing. What's Yosef doing? Why Yosef so, so the, way, the language, the Torah, 
Lo ken avi, no, my father. It sounds like Yosef is upset about something. What, what is he upset about? There are various explanations of this. Rashbam says that, that Yosef brought his children to his father in the following way. He put Menashe on his right and Ephraim on his left. And Yaakov, Yosef thought, that Yaakov thought, that Menashe was going to be on Yosef's uh, right. So therefore he told his father, you got to, I, I did this good for you, dad. It's all set up. It's not, I didn't think about my right and my left. I'm doing it for you. I put my firstborn son on your right, on my left, and my second son on my left, on your right. It's all set up, dad. Don't worry. It's all, it's all clear. I, I did this for you. So, so Yaakov tells him, I know, I know. But what, but there's a, it's something in the words of Yosef that makes us ask that something, something more. The al Sheikh says, that Yosef was like his protesting. Isn't it enough? You're going to favor my younger son? Don't you know what happened to me, Dad? Don't you know that all my brothers hated me and threw me in a pit because you favored me? Do you want to continue this on to the next generation and make the, the, this, this, the Talmud says we should learn from Yaakov how not to educate our children. <laughs> That's how the Talmud says that. You should always never change that one of your children give them extra special attention because... Uh, <laughs> It, 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 make, it doesn't work out. It makes, je- it makes jealousy among your children. So, so uh, what, is he, what is Yosef doing? So the Igda Chalo, the Ben Yisachar, has a very, very fascinating idea that Eli started to say. Very, he said like this. Look at the whole book of Bereshit. The whole book of Bereshit is full of jealousy. The whole book. It's all about jealousy. Jealousy of brothers. You have the story of Cain and Hevel. Cain is jealous. Because the world has to be divided in two. Why can't he have the whole world? <laughs> what is Hevel doing there? And even before Cain and Hevel, Adam, Adam had shown he's jealous of God. God knows more than him. He'll eat from the tree, then he'll know as much as God. And they go to the next generation. You go to Avraham and his sons Yitzhak and Yishmuel. They're jealous of each other. And uh, then you go to Yaakov and Esav, and Yaakov tries to kill Esav. It gets a little bit better yeah. by Yaakov and... Uh, sorry? It tries, it tries to kill Yaakov, thank you. It goes, when Yaakov's children, there's again jealousy between Yosef and his brothers. And here, Yaakov says a blessing to Menashe first. And what does Menashe do? Instead of Menashe being all upset and saying, oh no, he's, he's putting me down. By the way, the psychologists did a study about firstborns. A lot of times firstborns have a like, chip on their shoulder. You know why? Because you're, you're, you're meant to be like the coolest kid in the family, right? But what happens? When young next kid is born, so then he's cute. And the older kid has got like a stigma. He's not as cute as the younger kid. So, so it, it's really, the whole entire book of Bereshit, there's this jealousy going on. And the, the jealousy is solved, Yaakov feels. He sees, I put Menashe first, I, I, I put him in front of, I put Ephraim first, rather. And still, he's not jealous. He's not saying, oh, why are you doing this to me? He's still, he's okay with that. That's something that, I want all the Jewish people to have. I want people to never forget this. I want people to always be like a fry and Asher, never to be jealous. Really, what prevents us from focusing on our own talents and our own, and our own opportunities is the fact that we look at other people. As they say in Ivrit, this expression, your beauty makes me ugly. The thing that stops a person from using out his own talents is the fact that you're looking at over your shoulder what someone else could do. What prevents us from looking at you know, what I could do and, and what I'm able to do is, is I think what someone else could do. Rabbi Kagan and I, we studied together in uh, Rabbi Shachat's yeshiva over here in, 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 in Chabai Yeshiva in Los Angeles. A couple decades ago. A couple decades ago, <laughs> like yesterday. And Rabbi Shachat, uh, he, um, he once wrote to the Rebbe an interesting question. He wrote to the Rebbe like this. He wrote to the Rebbe, you know, I, um, I'm never going to be able to be like the Vilna Goyen, like the Alter Rebbe, and as much as I try, I'm going to try, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, I'm going to stand on my head, I'm going to hold my breath for five hours, I will never be like, like, like Ramesha Feinstein and all these great Talmudic giants, I will never reach their toenails. So what am I trying to do over here in Yeshiva, study Torah all day and all day and all, all night? I'm never going to make it to be classified as one of the great ones. So the Rebbe responded, I don't understand the question. It doesn't say in the Torah, I was created to become like Rashi, like the Rambam. I was created to serve Hashem. I was created to serve Hashem with what Hashem gave me. You don't have to accomplish what someone else can do. You don't have to accomplish what Hashem gave you to do. Abzusha Vanipoli, the famous Hasidic master, he said, when I come to heaven, I'm not afraid of the following question. 
I'm not afraid if they ask me, how come you weren't like Avraham? I'm not Avraham. I'm not afraid they're going to ask me, how come you weren't like Rashi? I'm not Rashi. I'm only afraid they're going to ask me, how come you weren't like Zusha? That's his name. I, that's the question we have to ask. So Ephraim and Manasseh, by them having this love for each other and, and not to, to looking at each other and being jealous of each other, despite the fact that Ephraim was given superior gifts, so Yaakov acknowledged it superior gifts, that, Yaakov says, this is something you always have to bear in mind. But it goes deeper than that. Because if that's the only explanation, let's look at Moshe and Aaron. Moshe and Aaron, it says in the Torah, that who is chosen to be the leader of the Jewish people? Moshe, the younger brother. God skips the older brother Aaron. Aaron is neither Kayin Gadol, but the leader of the Jewish people is Moshe Rabbeinu. What was Aaron's reaction to Moshe being chosen? He was happy. God testifies in the Torah. Aaron is very happy with the choice of Moshe Rabbeinu. So if you want to choose two brothers who are getting along with each other and care about each other and not jealous of each other, they're not the only ones. They're not the only ones. You also have Moshe and Aaron. Why, why don't we bless our children to be like Moshe and Aaron? Why, why do you bless them specifically to be like Ephraim and Asher? You might answer that they're the first ones we see this unity by, but in Torah, the chronological order isn't, 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 uh, doesn't answer everything because the Torah isn't written in chronological order in the first place. All things in Torah are out of order. Everything in the Torah has a deeper meaning. Some, there must be something that we're looking at a, a national frame for that, uh, that tells us a lot about who we are and how we should bless our children and what should be the model, what should be the direction we want our children to, uh, to go for. The Rebbe would, would share a story uh, uh, that, talk, that expresses how a lot of people sometimes they go for a mission which isn't theirs. They focus on something important, but they're called in, in uh, Neshama Tata'ot, souls that get lost, lost souls. The analogy that ever gives is like this. There's a, a, a guy, a rich man who has a wagon driver. The rich man and the wagon driver go to shul, and uh, the rich man... Uh, he, he, on the way to the shul, he sees this wagon stuck in the mud. And, oy vey, wagon stuck in the mud, he's got to do something about this. What does he do? He tries to get the wagon out of the mud, but he's not a wagon driver, he has no idea. So he goes and he gets a, a clapped and, 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 and he gets all dirty and he falls in the mud, and the wagon's still there and nothing is accomplished. Meanwhile, his wagon driver goes to the synagogue and there's, he's the first guy in the synagogue and there's ten guys who need a place to eat. Oh, come to, to, come to eat with me. And uh, when the, at the end of the services that night, the, the uh, gabai the, goes around, says, does anyone need a place to eat? And everyone in the place to eat, we're all going with this guy, you know, the wagon driver. Now, the wagon driver's meager uh, food couldn't satisfy these, these, these 10 people he brought with him. They're all going to divide like one piece of chicken or something. And the rich man didn't do the right thing either, even though he was wanted to do the right thing, but he didn't have the means, he didn't have the knowledge, he didn't have the wherewithal to be able to get the wagon out of, out of, out of the mud. So then it says that when these two souls came to heaven, there was a decision. The decision was that they had to come back again. Because they each did the wrong mitzvah. They chose a mitzvah that wasn't their mitzvah. Hashem gives each person a certain scenario in life, your people you know, the friends you know, the, the situation you're in, even mission there, exactly as we were discussing last week, you're exactly where you're supposed to be. What was unique about Ephraim and Manasseh, what their blessing was, and what Yaakov was so impressed with them, and Yaakov tells us all to follow with who they were, was that they were born in Egypt. Yaakov actually tells us straight in the Torah what was unique about them. Yaakov says to, to Yosef, your two children who were born to you before I arrived in Egypt, they are special to me like Reuben and Shimon. You know what was special about them? It wasn't, it wasn't what they did right now at this moment because they had love for each other. It was because they were able to be people that acted in the same spirit as Yaakov, despite the fact that they were growing up in Egypt. This is something that Yaakov said, when Yaakov looked at them, he was overcome with emotion. He said, ah, we won. We did it. Look at the name that we give our uh, patriarchs. What do we call Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov? What do we call them? We call them the Avot. We call them the fathers. What a name for our heroes. We call them the first Jews the fathers. What's happens to the fathers? Why don't we call them the the heroes of our nation. What does what is, what is Israel call the, the people, the pioneers? We call the, the Avram and Yaakov the fathers. Why do we call them the fathers? Because Avram was the first one who came around to the world. He wasn't thinking about 
himself and what he is a believer, he is the kind person. He was thinking, of what's going to stay after him? What's going to, what am I going to give to my children? Yes, sir. I have right, one question on something you said. How does someone know based off what's the right mitzvah, what's not the right mitzvah, right? The question, the question I would, uh, what I would assume is that the person is in the position because they're in, because that's what the position that God wants them to be, as you said. But that's like that's the mitzvah you're supposed to do. How are you supposed to know what's the right one and what's not the right mitzvah for you? Okay. The short answer is that there's a 13 page letter <laughs> of the brief. He's only telling you where to find it. <laughs> but but, but on, other, on the other hand, the Rebbe said, in the name of the Rebbe Rashab, the fifth Rebbe of Chabad, he says, the time we're in now is a time to grab and eat, grab and drink. It's not a time to ask, when, what is your mitzvah? You shouldn't say, I'm only good at this, I'm not good at that. And you should grab whatever mitzvah comes your way. So, don't worry about being the wagon driver or the rich man. Grab what comes your way. That's that's the that's the overarching principle. Oh, and and, and the, the Rebbe said, that why is it that Adam had such a hard time eating from the tree? Why was that the hard thing for him? Like, if, would it be hard for us to abstain from eating the tree? The reason it was so hard for him was because was because that was the mission of the time. That was so important. Sometimes it's something so important to you. That's why Hashem makes it harder for you. Because it's it's it, that's what your tikkun is. That's what you sometimes it, it's specifically the thing that's hardest for you. That that is your is your mission. That's why it it, it is so difficult because it's so it's so it's critical. A, it's a painful answer because it means you have to do the thing that's hard. <laughs> it's very painful. But but in this letter the previous Rebbe wrote to uh, Rabbi Einbinder's uh, father, the previous Rebbe gives a much more simpler answer. Which, as I said, it's a short answer. He says, look at your circumstance. Look what you have. Look what you could do. Like look who you are, where you were born, what you what you know. In other words. Look around at what you're able to do. It, 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 it's not, it, God doesn't want us to, just like when you're looking for a spouse, unfortunately there are rabbis in town, I don't want to say any names, they tell you what's your name, what's your birthday, what's her birthday, what's her name, Psst. you're going to get divorced, don't even try. <laughs> the, the, the guys like that in town, unfortunately. They don't, have, they don't have divine inspiration, but they pretend they do, and they really ruin people's lives. The, the Rebbe said, when you want to look, find a spouse, don't look for signs in heaven, look for signs on earth. Don't look for signs in heaven. Don't look for, for numbers and gematria. Look for inside. Look, look, is there a commonality between you? Do you have the same principles in living your life? Do you, do you have, is there, is there a, a attraction? Don't ask the questions about signs in heaven. Ask, ask for signs on earth. There was a chassid of the Alter Rebbe. He had a kretch me. He had a little inn. He had a little, uh, little uh, like, 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 like Yosef over here. You come by, you have lunch, you have mincha. And, uh, and someone used to come to his inn. He used to feed him. But you, you feed him for free. Because the guy couldn't afford to pay, and he's told the rabbi, he says, Rabbi, I'm doing this, I don't mean it. I'm just doing it because I feel bad he's in front of me, but I don't really care about him. I'm, doing, I'm not doing it with a chassid from my heart, I'm just doing it because he's in front of me. The rabbi said to him, don't worry about the kindness in your heart. Don't worry about the truth in your heart. Worry about the truth of his stomach. Make sure his stomach is truly full. Make sure it, so so the, it, it's not so important to know if it's, you're doing it with truth, if it's really meant for you, your mitzvah. It, it, that's not an important question to ask. The question is, what can you do right now? What are you able to accomplish? What do you have the wherewithal to do? And sometimes Hashem sends you things which aren't necessarily so easy for you, and that's even more important. Sometimes things are, are sent to you that uh, are easy. Just because it's easy doesn't mean it's not your mitzvah either. There was this boy, he learned in the yeshiva about various punishments of various sins. So he figured the worse the punishment must be more enjoyable. Must be more enjoyable. If it's, if it's a bigger punishment, must be more... Must, so he found... That's what he thought. The more bigger the punishment, the bigger the pleasure. So, so, so he thought, okay, uh, it says in the Torah, if you eat these forbidden animal fats, forbidden animal fats, your soul gets cut off. Whoa, your soul gets cut off. This must be great. <laughs> so he went to a candle store, and he bought a candle made out of these forbidden animal fats. He t- goes into a room, closes the door, no one should see. He takes the candle, and he takes a bite. <laughs> It wasn't worth it. It wasn't worth it. Just because something's, just because something is, is forbidden doesn't mean that it's enjoyable. It's not always the thing that's hardest for you that is the midst of the hour. Bottom line is, is that, is that it's good to have a personal spiritual mentor to talk to, to figure out if something is, if you have a question about something that's coming your way and you're, and, and you're not coping, you know, you should speak to your spiritual mentor and decide if this is something that, that you could do or not. Sometimes, sometimes you need to jump higher. Sometimes you just, you know, but, but getting back to Menashe and Ephraim, Yosef named his children Menashe and Ephraim. Each of their names signifies something. Yosef named his older son Menashe and his younger son Ephraim. What does Menashe mean? Menashe means to forget. It sounds like the seven dwarfs. 
You know, what we name the son forget? Well, what, what does that mean? So the answer is, Yosef didn't want to forget. He didn't want to forget his father's house. He wanted to remember where he came from. What's his second son's name? Ephraim. He, besides the fact that he, want, that he doesn't want to forget where he came from, he also wants to be successful where he is. He wants to think of what Hashem wants him to do over here. So he has two different things he has to be conscious of. Where he came from and what he has to do over here. What's more important? So the first thing, it seems, you've got to remember where you came from in order to do anything. You have to have Menasha first. That's what Yosef's first son is Menasha. The first thing you've got to do to educate a child, it seems, is tell, close the doors on Friday night. Don't let the outside music in. Sing the song with your children. Tell your children about your father and your grandfather and where you come from. And, and, and it seems that, that that's important, right? But also, besides that, children aren't like a, um, like a, uh, a, a tea kettle. You don't, you don't fill them with water. If you're going to take a child to be successful where he is, you have to, you have to light him up. You have to, you have to have a reason to be. A kid comes over to you, Eitan. He said, your son says to you, Tati, could I have... Say, why are you saying Tati? I'm not Ashkenazi. <laughs> Whatever. He says, says, Dad, Abba, can I have a cell phone? I want to have the new iPhone 8. No. So your answer is no. Okay. <laughs> well, why not, he says. I don't know if you know your kids. My kids say, why not? What do you say with the why not? What's your answer? There's a Menasha answer and there's a Frame answer. The Menasha answer is, you know what's inside a cell phone? In a cell phone, you could do all the three worst of various of murder, idolatry, and adultery, all together with a cell phone. Are you kidding? You know how much clip and how much negative evil is in a cell phone? This is the worst thing for you. And the son doesn't really believe you because he sees you looking at it all day long, literally. Whatever. But that's one answer. <laughs> then there's another answer. There's a Fryam answer. The Fryam answer is, is look at your child, and you see the good in your child. And you, you don't, it's not all about the negative, what's bad in the world. You tell your child, my son, you have something in you that's special. I don't really know what that is. It's a soul. But we've got, we got to find what that special thing in you is. You're, you're worth more than the cell phone. You could accomplish so much more than what's inside this thing. You have something far greater in you. You have an neshama. You know what you could do? You can connect to Hashem. You can learn Torah. This is, not, this is not for you. You could do far more. A kid comes home with a bad grade in school. What does Menashe do? What is the Menashe energy? He says, what are you doing? You know, if you do this again, you're going to mount it. You're going, you're going to end up working downtown in textile. <laughs> <laughs> and a frame answer is, and a frame answer is, you tell your child, you know, my child, you, I know this, this great does not reflect who you are. I know this isn't you. I know that you are a precious, amazing guy, and you have so much in you. You're so smart, and you're so, and you're so diligent. This doesn't reflect. I'm going to give you. I'm gonna, if you get three uh, notes from your teacher next week that you were, I'm going to give you something. It's a, diff, it's, a diff, it's a different answer. So which one has to be there, the Menashe or Ephraim? Oh, speaking of Beit Hillel and Shammah, you, 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 I, I wasn't going to mention this because you had to go, but I'll just one, mention one more thing. What did Beit Hillel say? What did Beit Shammai say? Beit Shammai says, always greet people with a smile. Why do you say always greet people with a smile? Where do you get that from? Isn't he the guy who he kicked the person out and he said, convert me while I stand on one foot? And tell me the whole Torah, I stand on one foot. Beit Shammai said, when this guy came to him and he said, tell me the whole Torah, I stand on one foot, what did Beit Shammai say? Get out of here. Get out of here. Why? Get out of here. But after this experience, the Rebbe said, after this experience, Beit Shammai saw what Beit Hillel did to this guy, and how he brought him in, I brought him closer, and how it affected him. So that's why Beit Shammai switched gears. And from then on, he said, greet everybody with a smile. It was because of that experience. Because of the experience of, of Hillel. Because and he's, of that story. Huh? Because of that story. Because of that story. Wow. He says, greet people with a smile. So there are two things a child needs to hear. But the most important thing the child needs to hear is, as Yaakov told of Nash and Ephraim, you were born in Egypt, you're my children. You're my children. Why are they my children? Why are they Yaakov's children? What's so special about them? They're born in Egypt. Let's give our kids some credit. Our kids are living in the most... There's never been a such great changes in history as in the last, last few months. And our kids have such, uh, such changes going on and such winds are pulling them in all directions. And, and, they're, and they're born in Egypt and they're still children of Yaakov and they're davening. Let's give them credit, they're special kids. Mashiach comes, we're gonna try to get in the front over there to see what's going on, right? Who's gonna be in the front? Who's gonna be in the front? The little kids, our kids will be in the front. So the Torah is telling us this week, to know how, what our, our child, children are, 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 how special our children are, how precious they are, and the way to make them so special and precious is by highlighting to them and telling them how special they are. They have to, they have to hear that. I'll leave you with one more story, let you guys go. 
There's a woman named Branya Schaefer. She's a, a renowned speaker. She speaks all over the world about relationships. And she was one, one day having this, this, this thought. She goes around the world. She speaks all over the place. But is she really accomplishing anything? She got a phone call from the Rebbe's secretary, Rabbi Klein. So I want to show you something that someone just sent to the Rebbe. Apparently the Rebbe wanted her to see this. The letter was from a non-Jewish guy who was married to a Jewish woman who had just died. And in the letter, enclosed, there was a mezuzah. What's, what's this? He, she, she, she says to her like this. He says, he, says he, writes to, he writes to the Rebbe like this. He writes to the Rebbe that uh, my wife and I are married for many years. And we had this, this, this problem that we felt we're missing, we're empty spiritually. My wife said, let's go to the synagogue. She's Jewish, I'm not Jewish. Let's go to the synagogue. Went to the Reformed synagogue. I wasn't impressed. But I told my wife, so let's go to church. You convert to Christianity. It doesn't work. I tried your way. It doesn't work for me. You try my way. So, well, right, my wife doesn't really, didn't really want to do it, but she saw I was very serious, and so it's just she agreed. But the week before I'm, we're about to go to the church for her to convert, she saw this lecture about relationship that Mrs. Schaefer was giving, and she decided to try this le- lecture out. She said, come with me. Let's go to this lecture. They go to the lecture, and she tells... Uh, Mrs. Schaefer, at the end of the lecture, by the way, you know, this Sunday I'm going to convert to Christianity. So she, Mrs. Schaefer took out of her briefcase, she took out a, a Shabbos candle, and she gave her the Shabbos candle, says, light this, and pray to God, and ask God for direction. She took the Shabbos candle, and she said, I don't know how to explain it. He writes this to the Rebbe. I don't know how to explain it. When she lit that Shabbos candle, she lit up. She lit up. Whatever we were looking for, whatever, she, I know she found it in the Shabbos candle. And after she did the Shabbos candle, I knew that she wasn't going to convert, and she didn't need to convert. And not only that, she, she got a mezuzah. And then she, she said that, that she got sick. She, went to, she had to go to old age home. I took care of her. And when she died, I was thinking that she should be buried in the, in, next to me. We have plots in, this, in, this, in the cemetery. But then I realized this isn't for her. So I asked the rabbi of the old age home if he could help me arrange a Jewish burial for her. And he did. He arranged a Jewish burial for her. And he said... That, uh, that I, the rabbi told me that he is from Chabad. So I figured that, that, that and, and this lady also came, she also mentioned she's connected to Chabad, so I figured that I would send to you the mezuzah, maybe you know what to do with, to find a good use for the mezuzah, because I don't need the mezuzah anymore. And here, is, here is the mezuzah. There's a lot of things going on. Everyone has stuff going on in their head. Everyone has things going on. Different, 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 different directions get pulled, and so do our kids. The, 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 the Torah tells us this week, Vayechi, Vayechi means to live. In order to make our children be the way they're supposed to be, it's not just enough to push them, this is bad, that's bad, this is bad, this is terrible. You've got to light them up, get them inner and motivation, tell them what they could do, what they're capable of, and how special they are. L'chaim, 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 l